when I post from a place of inspiration and a place of like true desire to share, the engagement is dramatically higher than when I post from obligation because it's time, because I committed to a schedule, because I need to post one thing every day, you know, at the same time in order to create consistency with my brand. You also see a spiritual superiority come come up too, where people are like on the path and they're like, they think they're better than the next person just because they've done more work. And that's also kind of a shadow expression, kind of maybe in the other direction. There's the bypassing, and then there's the superiority, which is also a, a concern in this world we live in. The more you practice the light and love spirituality, the more you're leaving behind those other parts of yourself and you're creating this massive fracture essentially in your own consciousness. Hey there, and welcome back to another episode of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I am super excited today to talk about becoming, really removing the layers of conditioning and programming to find your most authentic and true self. And our guests in this episode are Benjamin and Azria from Becoming. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you so much for being here. And if you could just tell the listeners a little bit about your background and how you guys met, came together towards this mission and what you're up to today, I think that'll be a good way to just set the foundation and see where it goes. Beautiful. Thank you for having us. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, so I guess I'll start. Benjamin and I met, I'll kind of go backwards. We met we met in 2019. Within a few weeks of meeting, we were kind of planning our whole our whole lives together and really just recognized very quickly that we have a super aligned vision for what it is that we want to do with our lives. Benjamin had been deep in the business world for many decades as a serial entrepreneur and investor. And I had been more on the artistic kind of creative side as an actress and a screenwriter. And I had started my my journey, my spiritual journey and, and my transformational journey back in like 2014 and had kind of done a done a shift fully from that like entertainment industry identity into working as a coach and curating retreats and experiences. And so when when Benjamin and I met in 2019, the blueprint of the vision that I was holding, or as we call it, stewarding that I was very early really in, 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 you know, my ability to actually bring it to life was very complementary to something that he, he had been visioning as well from a very different angle, from a very different perspective and a very different skill set. So we kind of put the puzzle pieces together and very quickly realized that we were infinitely more powerful in our ability to manifest things together than we were separate. And our, also our love and our connection just amplified everything. It was like massive fuel to the fire. And so since then, for the last four and a half years, we've been going full steam, throwing ourselves headfirst into making it all happen. And we can share a little more about what it all entails, but if you want to give your backstory. Yeah, I'm, I come from a pretty serial entrepreneur background. My first business sold in 2010. We had 1,800 employees, started a bunch of other businesses, got in real estate, some other things, and ended up investing in a business that went sideways and kind of put me emotionally in a rock bottom moment. And I really started questioning. I was at a place in my life where I didn't need to work ever again and then put everything at risk. And I really looked in the mirror and didn't like what I saw and went through a pretty dark night of the soul and... And it catalyzed a real spiritual awakening. And I made a commitment that I was going to live with real purpose and make a difference in the world. And kind of shortly thereafter, I met Azria and then started deep work with plant medicines and ayahuasca. And, and yeah, as she said, as soon as we met, we saw how our different and unique skills together were amplified and, and powerful. And, you know, here we are today, we, we wrote a book where have a personal transformation platform and we're in the process of building a pretty significant compound slash retreat center in Mexico. So yeah, super exciting and l looking forward to the conversation with you. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for the context and, you know, just uh, researching you both a little bit uh, prior to the pod, I felt like there might be a little bit of similar similarities to our story. I'm not sure exactly though, but for me, 
You know, I built a million dollar company while working less than four hours a day. It was named Silicon Valley's 40 under 40 list. And I was just so unfulfilled. You know, I was going through this numbing depression. And what I found was really, it seems to be that one of the main tracks that people get called to plant medicine or really going within is hitting this level of success, feeling like you cracked the code to what you wanted and what you desired and being like, man, I thought. I'd feel different. I'm curious if that resonates with either or both of you. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, when I went through this rock bottom moment where I was really questioning everything in my life, I, I created, I, I realized I couldn't trust myself to make decisions based on kind of what I thought I knew and who I thought I was. And what you thought success was. And what I thought success was. And so I created a new operating system for my life. And then after meeting Azria, that's really evolved. But in our work, in our course, you know, we take people on a journey over a long period of time of literally making a new operating system for their life, like building a deck that now guides their life and and really redefining success and examining your life and your perspectives and your patterns so that when you project forward, you, you're, you're doing it from your truest perspective and your truest self. And really going on this journey of we, we also, the work we love to do, what we're passionate about is working with people that are at that place that you just talked about where they've reached a certain level of success. And they're like, wait, 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 this isn't what I thought it was going to be. And our passion is really working with people like that and helping them design a new operating system, helping them remember who they were designed to be and why they were put on this planet. And so that's what lights us up. And yeah, that resonates a ton for us. Thank you for sharing that. And I'd be curious what that operating system and strategy looks like, because I imagine, you know, there's a lot of different paths to get there. And I don't think you guys specifically work with people that are working with plant medicine per se. Is, it, is that right? Or how do you approach this with the people you're working with closely? We've built out a pretty significant methodology. So our work has certainly been informed by the work with various, you know, plant medicines and modalities and psychedelics have been powerful for us, especially in that sort of expansion of consciousness and awareness and expanding beyond the five senses, expanding beyond reality as we know it, right? The default world that we're, that we all exist within, but there's, there's so many more layers to so many more dimensions to the, the, the experience that we can have. But a big focus of ours is really on modalities and tools that people can use at any point, right? Because there's also a lot of people doing plant medicine who aren't integrating that work really. And then it just becomes a peak state that you can't emulate or replicate in your life. And then this gap between that world and the the, the regular world can get really get big and, and it can start to feel you can start to get really ungrounded, which is certainly something that I've moved through in phases as, as I've worked with these modalities. So there's been an increasing desire to create something that is that people can use really on a daily basis, you know, and, and there's so many different, we're pulling from so many different types of teachings, really, things that have supported us on our path. For example, we work with archetypes. Those are a big part of the operating system, which of course is, you know, more Jungian and so based in psycho psychology, but we've kind of created our own framework around archetypes that we work with people on. We really believe that so much of the work is about understanding your story, right? Who you, who you were based on your conditioning and your upbringing and all of that, and, and really going pretty deep into that. We have a process that takes people through that. We call it excavation, where they really can unpack all of these potentially forgotten layers of themselves, of experiences they've had that have shaped them in, in significant ways and are shaping them today unconsciously. So it's about illuminating those blind spots and starting to really see the connection point between things that happened in the past and how we're showing up in the future or how, we, how we're perceiving ourselves in the future, our relationship to life. You know, do we ultimately, do we have a trusting relationship with life? Do we feel like life has our back and is here to support us and here to provide opportunities for us to grow? Or do we see life as, you know, against us and we have to kind of always be in this battle with life? And I think most people feel the latter. And so, yeah, there's there's a lot of rewiring that happens in our, in our process, in our program. We also work on the energetic level quite a bit. So really helping people understand that we, even though it feels like we're physical 
beings that have this limited, you know, flesh suit that we operate within. From a more quantum physics perspective, we're, we're really energy and we really are so much more malleable than we realize. And so is our reality. And so helping people understand energetics, what we call energetic agility, which is the ability to kind of at will shift your energetic state, which is also your emotional state, your internal state, what it is that you repel or attract at any given moment is all related to your to the energetics, right, of your, your mind, body, spirit. So a lot of our work is around polarity work, alpha, omega, as we call it, as we're moving away from using words like masculine, feminine, but really helping people understand that we, we have this polarity inside of us that we can, the more we understand it, the more we can dance with it, the more we can develop this energetic agility, which is that capacity to s- sort of switch into the, the pole that is most relevant for whatever that current situation requires, right? So if you're in a leadership position and there's chaos in your company, you know, you you get to step into that alpha, we would call it like the alpha pole where you're holding the space, you're holding the structure, you're creating direction, you're creating clarity, you're unwavering in your knowing of like, this is the direction we're going. For example, whether you're feel, feel, female or male, doesn't matter. Or alternatively, if you're getting into an argument with, you know, your partner and you can feel that there's this tension building and both people are trying to be right and it's getting, it's escalating. If one person has that awareness and can switch into the omega pole, they can soften, they can breathe more deeply, they can start to open, become receptive, you know, allow their intuition to take over, really deeply listen to the other person and it can completely diffuse the situation and actually create a really productive moment of connection out of something that may have otherwise become a huge fight simply because of that skill of energetic agility, which I think is at the core of really a lot of the work we do is is teaching people how to how to have first develop that awareness and then actually practice it in real time in real life situations. Yeah, so many threads to pull at there. And <laughs> it, it, it all is a practice at the end of the day. You know, my message is about soul life balance rather than work life balance. And with that, I talk about the archetypal energies of yin and yang as opposed to feminine and masculine, probably for similar reasons why you guys chose alpha and omega. Um, and one thing that I've found in speaking to corporate demographics about this message of soul life balance versus work life balance is that, you know, it's almost like a Trojan horse strategy when you're getting into corporate America, because you can't just like lead with medicine or spirituality or woo or esoteric themes right? Or at least that's what I found. So my question is, what I found to be one of the number one constants when people are going through a spiritual awakening is a career transition. And all three of us on this podcast right here have experienced that, right? And I I know very few people that haven't gone through some form of a career transition along their awakening path. And it seems like there's not really much guidance on that. So I'd be curious from your perspective in terms of one of my favorite words that you used, integration, integrating your spirituality into everyday life as it relates to your work and your career. What comes up for you when you think about career transitions? Yeah, I think I'd agree with you that transitions in general are definitely a catalyst for spiritual awakening. And I think it it can also come in the form often of what we see as in relationship transitions as well. I think that, I guess I don't, I won't answer your question directly. I think that when, when for, for me and, and the people we've worked with often there, there's this feeling of either there's a pain that they're trying to solve for, or there's a, a boredom or an apathy that's present. But people in these, when they're, they're in a career that's just not fulfilling, it often manifests in so many different ways. And physically it might manifest as, as distress or just fatigue, whatever that might look like. And, and so a lot of times it's when that comes up is, is paying attention to that. And they typically, or, or we have then explored, you know, what that can look like. And I think it's then, then starts the journey of looking introspectively of, of who have I been? What are my patterns? What are my belief systems? And really questioning those. And so in our, in our work, we take people through a process of really 
examining, and as you use the word excavate, but but examining all those belief systems and then really questioning them in a way that allows them to really create a, a new paradigm, a new way of, of seeing the world. And so we don't, in our work, we don't really tell anybody what they should think or, you know, how they should live their lives or give them any direction. It's more like really holding the mirror up, asking the right questions, and then kind of helping them peel the onion back to then really define what lights them up, what, what, what gives them energy, what's inspiring to them. And, and I think you're absolutely right that it's often a, you know, career transition moment where we catch people, you know, in, in this work. I think underneath the career transition is this this very sort of fundamental collective pattern that so many people are unconsciously caught in, which is this sort of like light at the end of the tunnel phenomenon, mm -hmm. right? Like when I get that promotion or when I make my $5 million a year or whatever the threshold is for whoever's listening to this and might be resonating, it doesn't actually matter. But there's always this sort of, I'm going to push myself and I'm going to force myself to do things I don't want to do so that I can get to this place. And then when I get to this place, then I'm going to be happy and then I'm going to be able to be relaxed and then I'm going to be able to be purposeful. And I think that's that paradigm is what's dissolving right now in a big way. And But because it's also still a, a newer thing, right, where this this was such a deeply embedded belief system for so long that now for those who are starting to break out of it and realize, hold on, that's an illusion, no matter what the next thing is that I assign my happiness to, you know, at the core of it is it's, it exists outside of the present moment. So therefore it must always remain an illusion. Once you have that realization, which I would say is a fundamental part of the awakening process, now things get complex, right? Because then it's like, okay, if that's true, then then from a career perspective, what what do I do, right? That would actually, as Benjamin said, light me up. And the only way to answer that question is to actually find out who am I really? And without that awareness, without those questions, you can't actually choose a new career that ultimately will fulfill you because you 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 haven't you haven't done that first step of the work to align your inner truth, your inner joy with that that daily external work that you're that you're creating in life. And so I think for a lot of people find themselves in a gap where it's like, I know I can't do the old thing anymore. I know I can't go to this job anymore or run this company anymore or whatever the thing is. But I also don't have any idea what's on the other side of letting it go. And I think that's, all, we talk a lot about death in our work and death portals. And that gap is that death portal. It's like the abyss or the threshold between two known worlds. And you have to traverse that unknown valley of, of, of completely letting go of who you thought you were and what you thought you wanted and all of the cultural definitions of success in order to then from that emptiness, essentially, meet yourself at a deep enough level where that starts to inform what the new thing is. And that then a lot of times can be a process that can take time, right? To build a new version of yourself and not just in your personal life, but also in your career and in your professional life. Yeah, it's not going to happen overnight. And, and this goes back to what you said earlier about trust and remembering that the universe has your back. And I think most of us that are working with medicines understand that, and especially in that space, it becomes crystal, crystal clear. And then going back into your normal life and integrating this newfound awakening and realization, remembering all of these different things and being like, wow, it really is all so simple and we just overcomplicate and then we get caught up with things. So what would you say to someone that has gotten that taste, that inner knowing of like, man, this is simple and I'm overcomplicating it. And then they get, get caught up in integration and integrating back to their normal life and they're trying to make changes, but they're just getting stuck and it. it's feeling heavy and difficult and challenging. I mean, honestly, I think it's a, it's, it's a constant dance. I call it the dance of forgetting and remembering. Like, I guess what I've observed having now been on this path for almost a decade is the forgetting 
phases get shorter and shorter. So in the beginning, you have that spark of, I'll call it remembering, right? Connection to a deeper truth, connection to your, to your true self, whatever you want to, however you want to frame it. Connection to a higher power. And you get, you get that felt remembrance, that felt sense of like, yes, this feels right. This feels true. How do I hold on to this feeling? And maybe it's in a meditation or a breathwork session or a really intimate connection with another person or a plant medicine ceremony, whatever the thing is, right? But it's outside, usually it's outside of the context of our daily lives. Then we go back into our daily lives and then the habits and the routines and the pressures of society kind of just keep coming back in. And we fall often without realizing it back into the forgetting. So we forget what we felt in that moment of truth. We kind of have a vague memory of it, but we can't really quite touch it anymore. It's not as vivid or visceral. And But we know that it exists and we know that it felt real, right? So then it's like, okay, what do I need to do to tap back into that? And then you start to get better and better at creating the circumstances that facilitate that connection. And that's where all the practices come in, right? The daily practices can really help with that because you're creating circumstances for yourself physiologically, psychologically, spiritually, in all the ways, right? You're creating the space and the time, the practices to help you come back into that remembering. And the more committed you are to that practice, the more you can exist in the remembering and also exist in the regular world without completely losing that truth every single time you go back into, you know, daily life. And I think you can start to master that skill. It just takes time, like anything, right? Like wanting to build an incredible body and get super strong and gain 20 pounds of muscle, like you're going to need to be really consistent with that. It's the same thing with this. It's just that you're developing your energetic sensitivity, your spiritual connection, your connection to your intuition. And a lot of it has to do with actually removing the noise, taking away information versus adding more information. And I think that's a kind of a fundamental shift in because we live in such a culture of consumption that we're like, what, what more do I need to do? Or what more information do I need to intake? And I think a lot of times it's actually the opposite. It's like, what can you yeah. stop doing? Where can you eliminate input so that you can remember that deeper truth inside? I can't even tell you how many medicine ceremonies I've had to the end of it, gotten to the end of it being like, we don't need more books. We don't need more podcasts. We don't need more documentaries. And the paradox there is like, I've had six different podcast shows over the years. I've written four books, you know, through and through like content creator, like, oh man, what, this is interesting. Like, but it really, yes, it's a yes. And to me, you know, because we, yeah. it is a paradox and we, we mm -hmm. need this to ignite it and get the intuition or yeah, the remembering the inner knowing all these sorts of things. But I think where a lot of times we get lost is we just want to consume more and all that. And we're not really integrating that because integration doesn't mean just plant medicine. It's like going to a conference and then how are you going to make changes when you come back? How are you going to integrate, right? Integration is every point of our life. Really? So yeah, if you want to speak to that, Benjamin, feel free. No, I, I think I agree with that wholeheartedly. I think that there's a, you know, we have a proclivity to be seekers, to be consumers. And, and, and then simultaneously we think those are bad things, but they're, they're actually, that's the first step of the process. And it's that seeking energy is what drives people down this personal transformation path. And, you know, I've certainly read a ton of personal development books and gone on that work and there's this energy of seeking and that's vital. And that's, that's, then there's a maturation that happens where you move beyond the seeking and you start to realize that everything you have is within you, but, but you can't really get to the second step without going through the first step. And so there's a time and place for seeking, for consuming information and, and, podcasts and books and and there's a maturation and evolution of that where it's just it's integrated in you and you don't necessarily need to have you know the, the phd of the person that wrote the book but you you've integrated the the essence of the information which has been you know i spent most of my entire life in that seeking consuming energy and it's just in recent years that i've really landed in in, in a place where I'm feel I feel embodied and but it you know it it's it's a it it's a it's a practice and as as you as you go down this path you start to feel more and more embodied and 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 start and seek less and to Asriya's point kind of just go be in nature and that's that's the book I just got back from a 
a dieta, plant, deep plant medicine retreat in Peru. And I brought the Gene Keys, which is a really powerful book that I, I read. And the, the, the shaman who was holding the space, he's like, the book is nature. Like study the jungle, just go be mm -hmm. in the jungle and watch the trees and the leaves and the animals. And that is the book. And I think that that was really powerful. And I spent, you know, 10 days, we were mostly in silence. So we weren't even speaking to each other and just deep in the jungle. And it was really powerful to just kind of be in that energy. And over time, you just start to feel like you're part of it. And so I, I but, but but reading all those books was essentially essential for me to even get to the place where I could, I could be in that space. That, that's beautiful. Yeah. That totally resonates. And you know, I've often wondered too, if it's the jungle that is clearly way more alive than you guys are in LA, I'm in Santa Cruz, we're both in California and we can just, you know, generalize it as being in the United States is the jungle. Is it that the jungle is way more alive, which it is. Or is it that we're slowing down and we're noticing, but like, I mean, it just becomes so apparent. I haven't been to Peru, but my time in Costa Rica, you know, is similar to what I would imagine at least. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's both, right? It's, it's what you, you can slow down and, and I think I, I heard Jay Shetty talking once and he was talking about when he was a monk how they would go on this walk and the goal of the walk that they would do this, the same walk every day was to notice something new on the walk every day. And I think that when you, you become good at noticing and, and creating awareness around the beauty around us all the time, then you, you become more integrated in, in that. And, and it's really, I think that's, that's a, a big practice in and of itself. Well, it's the practice of actually being present in the moment, which is of course where all of the joy exists and yet it's so it's so easy to get lost in all of the hypothetical future moments. So it's this constant battle. And I think for a while, I judge myself for sometimes losing that battle, but battle in a significant way because I am a really visionary person. And I think as a visionary person, you do see things that are beyond the present moment, outside of the present moment, things that you're meant to bring into being, into reality. So they don't yet exist. They maybe exist on the conceptual plane, right? On the idea plane, but they don't exist yet in, in this measurable third dimensional reality. And so I think it's also coming back to this idea of who you were designed to be, embracing that we're all designed differently. And some of us are designed to be visionary and to see things beyond what is here now and to innovate upon what is here now and to take all of the beauty and all of the ingredients of what is here now and use the present moment as an access point into a realm of infinite possibilities and then pull from that realm back into this realm the things that get to be created to make the world a more beautiful place for others as well. 100%. Yeah, I, I call that how to be in the matrix, but not of it, mm -hmm. right? And recently I saw, Azria, on your Instagram, you had a post, I forget exactly what you wrote, but it was like, you're done with the influencer game. Could you speak to that a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wrote that I'm, I'm opting out of playing the influencer game. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it's been, I went really deep into the creative realm in my Hollywood days and then really deep into the sort of spiritual, personal development realm, shamanic realm for several years. And now I'm in this chapter of integrating everything I've learned into, into the business and entrepreneurial expression. And that's really a new chapter for me. And so with that, knowing, I've known for a long time that I have a message to share with the world, but the way in which I share that message and the speed at which I share that message and the scale at which I share that message that's all kind of stuff that I'm exploring and, and experimenting with right now. And one of the avenues of experimentation has been social media and using, you know, my, it's been very organic for me to share my journey over the last eight plus years through Instagram, just because it was a simple tool that I could use to share what was in my heart organically when it felt true, when it felt right. And it, you know, built a really beautiful community. And also a client base for me, which was really helpful as someone who was emancipating herself from needing to work for someone else. Um, and now I think there's been this, there was a question for me about, about probably about six, 
six to eight months ago of like, what would happen if I really took that more seriously? Like if, if, if I played the Instagram social media influencer game more professionally, because there's a strategy there, right? You can, you can do certain things and it's going to increase your reach. It's going to increase your following. And so that, that was this phase of exploration over the last six months, specifically in marketing a digital program that we have where I really kind of gave myself fully to playing by those rules. Those are the rules of that game. And on the other side of launching the program, really just deeply reflecting, you know, turning my phone on silent, going for a nature immersion for five hours by myself and just really coming back into the truth of my own spirit, my own heart and feeling into what is the way that feels true for me to engage with the outside world and really looking at where what does it mean to create whatever your platform is, right? But let's say social media, but what does it mean to create from a place of inspiration versus from a place of strategy and a place of, you know, feeding the algorithm what you know you need to feed it in order to stay relevant? And how big of a gap there can be between those two things. And noticing how when I post from a place of inspiration and a place of like true desire to share, the engagement is dramatically higher than when I post from obligation because it's time, because I committed to a schedule, because I need to post one thing every day, you know, at the same time in order to create consistency with my brand. And just seeing that like real time feedback loop. I think social media is an amazing mirror, actually. So that post kind of came at the tail end of this exploration and saying, OK, I know I have a message and I know I want to share it. And, I, and I'm actually totally cool using Instagram to share it. But I don't want to play by the rules that rob me of my joy, because then I'm actually diluting the magnetism of the content itself, because it's felt, whether consciously or unconsciously, it's felt by the other person on the other side receiving it. Yeah. And I feel like, thank you for sharing that. I feel like trust and fear are the kind of three lines of what you just shared, because can we trust enough in the universe having our back that we don't need to sell ourselves and in something that's not in alignment? And are we doing that thing that's not in alignment out of fear? Yeah. You know? And it's really easy to tell yourself you're doing it out of service because you're like, well, I'm going to play the game. I'm going to feed the algorithm, but I'm putting good content into the world and I'm reaching more people. And, you know, it's really easy to justify all of this. Like it's, it's, it's such a mind game. Oh, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say so. So I've been dancing in that. that. That's where the post came from. All right. So obviously the segue here is the the thin line of spiritually bypassing. Could you speak to that? <laughs> oh, man. Well, I guess de defining spiritual bypass, maybe for those who don't know what that means, I would say it's, it's using a perspective of spirituality to ignore or repress certain realities that also exist within our human experience, a, a lot of which are related to the realm of fear and, and trauma too. And, and grief, which is really, let's, you know, if you were to just put a big umbrella word on top of all of those things, let's just call it the shadow state of our, of our human experience. And so in the positive thinking movement that I think has been very, has gone pretty mainstream, the premise there is very much, you know, your thoughts create your reality. The more positive your thoughts, the more positive your reality, right? It makes logical sense. And so therefore the advice is, well, if, if you have negative thoughts, then just ignore those and just focus on the positive or, or find the positive version of the thought that you want to feel and then focus on that. And it's not like that's complete bullshit. I think there's actually power in being able to, like I, I mentioned, an energetic agility, right? The ability to, to choose your experience and to choose not to spiral into a story of victimhood, but actually to choose a more you know, expanded or empowered state is something that you can develop. It's a skill you can develop to a point. But if you're constantly ignoring the deeper curriculum, as we would call it, like the emotional material that's present from your past, from all the experiences you didn't have a chance to process that are keeping you in a state of unconscious fear or contraction, then the more you practice the 
light and love spirituality, the more you're leaving behind those other parts of yourself and you're creating this massive fracture essentially in your own consciousness. Because at the core, you're actually afraid to feel those things. So you're actually still in fear, just using a positive, you know, positive umbrella to kind of like wrap it. And so I think the real move, the real power move is to say, I'm going to bring light into these dark places. I'm going to integrate and include these rejected parts of myself that are existing in shame or doubt or disbelief or whatever the thing is, rage. And I'm going to include them in my journey and I'm going to let myself feel them. I'm going to have the courage to feel them because I trust that through feeling them fully and not resisting them, they actually turn into that higher vibrational or more positive state simply by not resisting them. And so you end up in kind of the same place. You do end up in a more expanded state, but the way you get there is very different. Instead of pushing it aside, you're actually immersing yourself into it. And that becomes the avenue or the access point into that shift that you're looking for. So I think that the more aware we become of certain spiritual concepts, the more discernment we also have to have to where we're using those to, you know, avoid uncomfortable truths or uncomfortable feelings. Absolutely. Yeah. I think spiritually bypassing, thank you for getting into shadow work there. I think it's really easy to start to use your belief systems to justify a way of being or behaving and experiencing and going about your life. In terms of the shadow and shadow work, you know, this is a big buzz term within spiritual and conscious communities. And I kind of simplify it to be like, well, if you're willing to go into the depths of your psyche to do quote unquote the work, you know, that is shadow work. And then from there, there's different levels and degrees of shadow work of how, how deep you're going. But if you are experiencing something and you decide, oh, I'm going to numb myself with whatever it might be, but it's a spiritual dumbness because I'm going in a, a walk with my feet or whatever it is versus really sit with it, then like that would be, yes, you're like on the path of doing shadow work, but in that moment, you're not, you're choosing not to look at, it. but that's also okay. And this is where the spiritually bypassing comes in because if you have the awareness around it, then you tell yourself, well, no, I have the awareness around it. So I'm consciously doing this. And when I'm ready, I'll go back to it. So you can really get lost in your mind with all of this. Totally. Yeah. You also yeah. see, you also see a spiritual superiority come, come up too, where people are like on the path and they're like, they think they're better than the next person just because they've done more work. And that's also kind of, you know, a shadow expression kind of maybe in the other direction. There's the bypassing and then there's the superiority, which is also a, a concern in this world we live in. Yeah, I, I found it heartbreaking when I first experienced the spiritual narcissism. <laughs> I was like, wait, what? Are you kidding me? Not here. Yeah, so that definitely resonates. Yeah, this spiritual superiority. Okay, cool. So I want to talk about a few more things and I'm just looking at my notes here. There was something that was shared to me in preparation of this podcast. And I admittedly, I have not read your book Becoming yet, but I heard in it, I think it was you, Azra, that you wrote about what am I trying to fill? I think that kind of resonates around this topic. Could you speak to that a bit? Yeah, I mean, the context of that of that question was in the book where I shared about my my early Hollywood days when at age 21, I got blackout drunk and drove my car into a fire hydrant going 50 miles an hour. And I was examining kind of like the deeper why of, of what had me choose to do those things in the first place. And it was really this void that I think I was not very consciously aware of, but but was present in inside of me, this void that wanted to be filled by something, wanted to be filled by, you know, at the core, I think, more love and and wholeness. But I was looking for that fulfillment in the wrong places. I was looking for it in Hollywood nightclubs and alcohol and, you know, one night stands and that sort of stuff. And so I think that's that that was one of the first moments of awareness expansion that 
And a lot of times it is, you know, kind of a rock bottom or cataclysmic moment where quite literally like ramming my vehicle into a fire hydrant, which exploded everywhere, was like this wake up call, this jolt of sobriety in a way of like, holy shit, hold on, let me stop and look at, you know, just the reality that I, I, I was, I could have died. And I, I chose that, like I put myself in that position. And so what's going on there? You know, what's, what's that deeper lack or void that, that I'm not looking at? And I think, you, you know, people try and fill that in different ways. We, we fill it with food. We fill it with Netflix. We fill it with Instagram scrolls. We fill it with work. It's a constant dance, even for us. You know, I would say we're very purpose-driven. We're extremely focused on our mission. And we have a mission that is like truly, truly coming from the depth of our heart and our soul. And it's very fulfilling. And we also constantly have to be mindful to not fall into that loop of like, okay, if we can just get through this next six months, you know, and lift this giant project off the ground and and kind of like forget that we have a social life and forget that we have human bodies and just kind of plow through all of the work we need to do to make this happen, then then we'll be able to relax and unwind. So these patterns follow you, you know, we, we've been deep in this work for a long time, but these these patterns are so deeply ingrained that it requires real honesty and, and discernment, I think, to to notice where you're starting to slip into that same that same groove. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that resonates. That's kind of something that I was just talking with a friend about last night at the time of this recording with myself and this person as well, where it, it's it like, okay, right now I'm telling myself it's hustle season and I'm mute and that's the justification I'm using, right? Because I've spent so, um, I spent three solid years kind of ignoring my business and everything else and just everything just going within. And now it's like, okay, now it's alchemization of that, you know, and sharing and what you're saying earlier, but it's okay because I'm sharing and and helping people and being of service and all these type of things. So totally resonate with that in terms of fulfillment. What am I trying to fill? I know you both work with your clients as well with sexual healing. It seems like there, I have not gone down that rabbit hole or experience. I don't think rabbit holds the best way to say it, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> careful. <laughs> I didn't think about it like that when I said that, but yeah, that too. Sexual healing and what am I trying to fill? I feel like there's a kind of a, a cross line, like those two work well together. Could you explain that at all or what your sexual healing looks like? Yeah, we just to clarify, we don't pra- we don't facilitate sexual healing ourselves. We've both in our own o- only on ourselves, <laughs> only on ourselves, only only behind closed doors. No, we we've both gone through sexual healing individually, and certainly in our relationship, that's that's present. I think in any intimate partnership, sexuality is is a medicine that can be used intentionally. We do talk about it in our book, our personal experiences, but we're not like trained practitioners that facilitate sexual healing for other people. That rabbit hole is one that we have left untouched so far. Who knows where life takes us, but yeah. So sexual healing is, is, is a powerful modality. And, and certainly I think coming, tying those two things together and talking about like, what am I trying to fill or the void? I think certainly sex can be a thing that we use to chase, to fill something. And Benjamin can share a little bit more about his journey with that. For me, I think it was less that and more, I was disconnected from my sexuality. I wasn't sensitized to my body, really. I was, I had kind of disembodied myself in in a way that was very unconscious. I couldn't really see it until I was actually more in my body through this work. And then I could feel the difference. And I was like, oh, wow, I feel like I'm actually, I'm actually fully here now. And so my ability to experience pleasure in sex was very connected to how much I was actually connected to my body and how safe I felt in my body ultimately. And I think a lot of people and especially women struggle with orgasm or, or sexual pleasure because they don't feel safe in their body. Something happened somewhere along the way where they disconnected. It was easier to kind of use that, you know, using that language of bypass, like bypass the the body entirely and 
go numb, essentially, as a defense mechanism to protect from further pain or trauma. And that then also cuts you off from your pleasure and your ability to truly surrender into a sexual experience. So the sexual healing for me was about noticing where those protection mechanisms were in place and how they weren't allowing me to tap into that deeper power of my sexuality. And then slowly, methodically through hands-on, you know, body work and emotional healing and all sorts of different practices, collapse those defense mechanisms and unwind those contractions and allow things to open and allow energy to flow through you know, my organs, my body, my, my energy body, so that I could welcome in that current of energy, which I think sexuality is really a current of energy that we can tap into. And the more connected we are with that current, the more powerful our sexual experience becomes. Yeah, for me, it was radically different. You know, I, I spent most of my life, I think, you know, chasing women in a very lustful way and, you know, seeking this external validation, seeking to satisfy some deep insecurity in me. And, you know, this, this thing that you were talking about kind of feeling full, it, it's an insatiable, it's a, it's an impossible task. Right. And so through this work and really examining my life and who I am and what, you know, why I'm showing up the way I am. It was through this this transformation work and really looking at my childhood and seeing you know where the insecurity stemmed from and why I didn't feel safe in the world as a child. I really I couldn't really read as a kid. I was dyslexic, severely dyslexic, and so it caused this deep insecurity in me. And so I think that I wasn't able to make that correlation until I started doing plant medicine, and then I was able to really excavate where it was coming from. And then feel all those feelings that I've been avoiding my entire life. And, and I think through that work helped me realize that, you know, the conquest of women wasn't going to make me feel full in any way. In fact, did just the opposite. And I was finally able to kind of start to become still and really show up in the world in a different way. So it's, you know, kind of dramatically different, but, you know, sexuality is a part of being human and the way it was expressed in me was was just a a manifestation of how I felt internally. And so luckily I was able to finally make that correlation and do the work to kind of heal. Well, and I think a big part of that story is the show of the suit, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I had, I sat in a ceremony with a really powerful shaman, the most powerful shaman I've ever met. And in that ceremony, he kind of looked into my soul and, and said that I was being suffocated by this energy of, of lust. And he prescribed me 180 days of celibacy which we talk about in the book and, and 20,000 mantras. And I went through a pretty significant healing process and was able to kind of cut those energetic cords and also kind of ener- energetically also it was affecting my children in a way that he saw that I, I wasn't aware of. And we don't have time on this podcast to talk about how my kids were affected by my 180 days of celibacy in a, in a pretty crazy way. So, so yeah, so it's, it's sexuality has been a big part of our learning and growth. Yeah. Sounds like it. And definitely a whole, whole podcast episode, at least to dive into that. Thank you both for sharing that. As we start to wrap up here, I understand that you're building out a retreat center in Mexico. Could you tell us about that a bit? Yeah. From the moment we met within a couple of weeks, we were in Mexico on the beach and we had this vision of having a space that where we could build community, have people do transformational work together, you know, have festivals, conferences, convergences, like really just a, a space where people can come together who are on the path of all the things we just discussed. And we spent a couple of years scouting, found our dream property on the coast of Mexico, the Pacific side. And now we're about to break ground. If you're listening to this podcast in real time, then yes, maybe we've already broken ground by the time you're you're listening. So we're going to be building a pretty significant development there. And the vision is, you know, crystallizing in real time. But we have, you know, a a main kind of temple event space, which can hold a couple hundred people. And we're right on the beach. It's super remote. So we're really excited about this project. It's a, it's going to be a big lift, but it's it's coming along. 
It's awesome. Yeah, it sounds incredible. So definitely stay in touch with Benjamin Benjamin and Azria. All the social media handles are in the show notes. So you guys can stay up to date on when this retreat center comes to fruition. You can grab their book. I got the link in there in the show notes. Want to thank both of you so much for taking the time to come on the show and for how you're showing up in the world and helping others to unpack the layers of conditioning and remove their mask to access their truest selves. So thank you both so much for being on the show. Appreciate it. Uh, it's been an honor, brother. Thank you. Bye.